Calling on Dr. Shelley Lloyd. Uh, Shelley's been very steeped in education. She's an alumni of the Davinci Institute, having achieved a doctorate from the institution. Uh, she most recently retired as the director of the National Qualification Framework, director of the Department of Higher Education and Training. She's worked very closely with the various with the regulators. Um, she served on numerous education training councils and committees and uh, she works tire tirelessly in promoting uh, recognition of prior learning, etc. So you've got a summary of it. This is not a CV. It's a CV runs the pages. So uh, without much ado, I'd like you to listen to Shelley in terms of education integration in the fourth industrial revolution. To share around a, a topic that is very topical, um, I was thrown into the fourth industrial revolution stuff, if you want to call it that, uh, because of the work I was doing. As the director of a national qualifications framework environment and monitoring and evaluating and supporting the minister <coughs> and advising the minister regards, regarding NQFs, we had to make sure that what was coming out in the qualifications, what people were learning, what was being taught, etc., etc., would be relevant. If you have to ask me right now, where is our education and training system in South Africa vis-a-vis -vis the fourth industrial revolution? I'll say in certain areas, we certainly are far ahead. In other areas, we are lagging <coughs> behind. And I'll talk a little bit about that. But the, I don't like to actually term things like the fourth industrial and the fifth industrial and the third and first, although those terms are there. Because they are all happening interchangeably. We are almost straddling third, fourth, and fifth. We are in the fourth. We still have the third, and we are looking to the fifth. So what is this, how do, we as ed, how do we as educationists, what did we do as educationists in our environment, in a departmental situation, in um, ministerial bodies, with education and training providers in particular, in curriculum spaces to embrace this and what is happening in South Africa. I think all of you would be very interested to know what are we doing in South Africa in the education and training environment to make sure that those people that emerge from our system of education, training, teaching, learning and assessment, as well as our skills development system, which includes all of us in the workplace. We, we step in and step out of learning. We do short courses. We do CPD, all of this. What are we doing? How is our system responding? What is happening in a regulatory environment? Is it easy? Is it difficult? So with that as a frame, I'm going to read a, a yarn there. And I'm going to say that um, I've, done, uh, I've, I've actually done a lot of research around this because I'm busy now in a research project for, for the European Union. And it's a dialogue around learning outcomes. And one of the big issues around learning outcomes and how qualifications are designed relates to what is happening in the fourth industrial revolution. So it's very obvious from the literature that there is this seismic shift happening. We're reading about it. We're hearing about it. We know it is happening. We know that it's happening very, you know, in, in a very fast way and growing in countries like the UK, countries like America, some of the Ivy League universities have really put their, not only their toes, but their feet into fourth industrial revolution issues. So you've got MIT, you've got Harvard, you've got Stanford, you've got La London School of uh, Economics, you've got um, a whole range of universities in Australia as well that are starting to embrace what are, what are really disruptive and provocative approaches 
to teaching, learning, assessment and awarding of qualifications. In South Africa, we do have a, a, um, a reticence on the one hand to be provocative, to provoke the regulator in ways that the regulator might not like or doesn't understand. And we are also reticent because of um, a very, very contested space in public and private higher education and public and private college education, how we should move. And we are also very resource constrained. And you're right when you say that the public service, well, uh, they, they're sending off on retirement everybody that they could possibly retire. So they want to shrink that. So, so yes, these are, these are the issues. But there is this very big seismic shift happening. And in my world, which is a national qualifications framework world, which overarches education, training, skills development, and looks across the entire system, it obviously had to become a center focus and a core focus of is our NQF relevant? Are the qualifications we are designing, developing, delivering, are they relevant? Is our NQF capable of looking at a fourth industrial revolution environment? And I'd like to say right now it is not. I do not believe our current NQF and our current education and training system is capable of really embracing that fourth industrial revolution unless we do certain things. And the unless certain things, it's not so difficult. It's not impossible. We are already doing some things, but, but we are not there yet. So, in fact, the term industrial revolution, and this was very interesting, traces back to, the, uh, to 1884. So it's not a new term. And it's Arnold Toynbee that wrote a paper called Lectures on the Industrial Revolution, the first industrial revolution. And then and where he describes what an industrial revolution is. What fascinated me about his work and other authors is in the description of industrial revolution. We somehow believe in, in our fourth industrial revolution, for example, it is something that is quite technology driven and technological and almost engineering and mechanical and, and computer world. But there's a very, very interesting side to the fourth industrial, fifth industrial, whichever industrial revolution that we would be looking at. And a definition uh, uh, by another author that said the industrial revolution is not merely an acceleration of economic growth. It does, it brings economic growth. But it is also an acceleration of growth because of and through economic and social transformation. And I love that part of the social transformation as well. The impact, there's a the huge impact. So it's not just a concept, a term, a thing we do and we quickly pop it into our curricula and we quickly pop it into our businesses and we, we have this 4IR department eventually with the, with the annual performance plans and agreements and all of those things. But it, it is something that actually goes down into the very fabric of our lives, of our societies, of our communities. And that impact is, uh, and we need to start seeing where that impact is. And in fact, some of the researchers are talking about tipping points when we will really start feeling the impact of fourth industrial revolution. So here you have this body of research. Here you have this dynamic of economic growth, social impact. Here you have an education and training system that has to be responsive. Are we asking too much? Are we expecting too much? What can we do and how do we do it? And that has been my world of work for a while now. Having a look at how responsive can this big ship of an NQF, which overarches the white paper that was published on post-school education and training, says 
The NQF overarches the entire system. So how do you do this? And that's why I say some of us are starting to provocatively say our current NQF is heavy, cumbersome, stuck in a time warp. We need one. We need an NQF. We need something good and solid. But that's what we have now and where the regulators are and where we need to go are very different in a 4IR environment. The realities, uh, for, a for in, fourth industrial revolution um, often is often described as the results, and I like this definition as well, of an integration and compounding effects of multiple exponential technologies. And then they start talking about the exponential technologies, and we've seen this in reality. Every one of you in the room would be able to raise some examples. Artificial intelligence drone technology, the impact of big computers, the lessening of needing big storage spaces because of how we work with our information. Yes, that's also for <coughs> IR. The National Learners Records Database. Yes, that's also starting to engage and embrace for IR technologies. The ability for a drone to fly in when that little soccer team was stuck in the cave. They use drone technology, 4IR, to fly in to take photos and pictures. When you have to do rescues in these disasters, we are using 4IR technologies, and we're not even realizing it. That's why I say we are in it. But as integrated education is happening, and as we are trying to move in this space, we are not using formal qualifications to do it, we are not using people who come out of a three or four year uh, 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 program and it's accredited and if you're a private provider you're registered and all of those good things. Mm, no. They are using other people, other dynamics. And that is where education and training has to catch up how we design, develop our systems to respond more effectively to what, to what we have to do. The World Economic Forum, for example, defined some tipping points at which technologies in our fourth industrial revolution will become widespread enough to create massive societal change. And they give some very interesting examples. I wear glasses to read. They predict that by 2023, 10% of the world's people who use reading glasses won't need them anymore because our computers will be set up the minute I switch it on, it will automatically know I'm there and it will have the screen and I don't need reading glasses to work on my computer. If you're into reading books on Kindle, I don't. I love the feel of a book, so I'm not a Kindle convert. But uh, if, you, if you do that, your Kindle, your iPad. The other thing, and this I found strange, was that um, implantable cell phones by 2024... I've tried to imagine how that will work, I don't know. 80% of people in the world will have a digital footprint by 2023. Um, some even predict, and this I, th I was thinking of, of um, uh, our, our, uh, our, our Chancellor, Edward Kisveter, will even have artificial intelligence members of boards. <laughs> artificial intelligence auditors. <laughs> and robotic pharmacists, 3D printed motor cars. So these are the things Now you say, well, you know, it sounds futuristic. It's not, it's happening right now. We have got driverless cars. They, they're not only being piloted, they're already happening. We already have robo robots working in pharmacists, in large government hospitals, etc., <coughs> etc. Et the realities are there, but the issues are, who is working in that space? Are we creating a generation through our rigid approaches of people towards unemployment while the entrepreneur, the da Vinci's of the world, the, those people are populating the spaces because they have grabbed and taken hold of an energy, a vibrancy and an innovative mindset. And so coming back to the work I'm doing with the European Union, we were sitting, I was sitting in a room and I told John, my husband, a room full of people, 
we should have known better and we were discussing learning outcomes which we all know are very central to the design of our qualifications, the design of curricula, teaching and learning delivery and even setting of assessment tools. And I was thinking of this afternoon's presentation and I was listening to that and I thought if we get stuck there, heaven help us. It's a quagmire we'll never get out of. We have to think differently and that's why the European Union is having a dialogue around these things and saying where are we going and how do we embrace. So on, on all sides. Okay, I've spoken a bit of... I, I'm also talking, there's a very, very interesting finding, and I, I've, I've thought this, and I'll be very honest, subjectively thought about it, because I, my training is as an English teacher. I'm a teacher. I used to be a teacher. I love teaching. I um, was an English teacher, and so when they started this big drive towards only STEM, science, technology, and all of that, it worried me, because I always thought I taught lots and lots and lots of kids, both in academic high schools and in Tibet college environments. And I always thought the missing link, often for lots of those children, was that they couldn't communicate properly and articulate and talk. So I, I believe in broader than, than that. And research is showing in the fourth industrial revolution fifth industrial revolution environment, in this innovative creative environment, we need to start putting more and more and more focus on those things that you learn in a language environment. Problem solving, <coughs> ability to cognate, ability to comprehend, to analyze. That's why English teachers teach you praises so that you can read large bodies of work and come down. When you're doing your PhD, you read hundreds and hundreds of things and you come down and you pricey it down to what you want, etc., etc. So there's, a, there's a, a, a clear indicator in educational research related to fourth industrial revolution of a drive towards a stronger focus on those softer skills. And you were mentioning some of the softer skills as well. There's also a very strong drive in MIT, Stanford, and Harvard to have discovered this as they're looking at their curricula, that instead of the strongest focus being on maths and science, there's a very strong need to start focusing on computer sciences, coding, and all of those, those sorts of things. Are we there? No, we're not yet there. We, we are still in the STEM <coughs> mode, and we are still in the traditional um, sort of maths, science, and if you don't get those, then you, you, you're not clever enough to go to university type of thinking, which is wrong, and people still say that. So the fourth industrial revolution and the requirements of industry, business, um, entrepreneurial ventures, small business, is for a totally different profile of a learner coming out, the graduateness coming out, and that's what the research is showing. There's a very interesting um, uh, 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 finding from MIT, and they say a high premium will need to be placed on computer science subjects, and synthetic biology and engineering biology, or bioengineering, which trains students at the interface of life sciences and engineering. Now, we know if you just think across our education system and what we learn and how our children are taught. Certainly in the higher levels it's very traditional. But a very, very interesting thing is emerging in the lower levels and with the little ones and in the Department of Basic Education where they're starting to look at a blurring of, of the traditional ways of, of, of running a subject and they're starting far more to create these integrated spaces. Now some people are very worried, some of our regulators are very concerned that when you actually have to go and study at a university, because this is corrupting mode one, <laughs> it's really like mode two, already at the little east at that stage. So I find that, I find it wonderful that, that in that space they're starting to, to engage differently. 
and I, I believe it should filter up. Obviously, we know what are what are the issues that we talk about. What are the issues in education that we can look at in the fourth industrial revolution, uh, delivery, teaching, learning, delivery, etc. Again, Harvard. I remembered um, Harvard was the first university, and 2012 was really the year of the MOOCs, massive online open courses. So it's not new. We are battling even to get a footprint of MOOC. But 2012. Harvard University education faculty, the dean of the faculty was told, we want to pilot this thing. And you've been selected to pilot it. So he said, on one day I had like 200 students in my class, he said, and the next day I had like 2,000 people from all over the world speaking different languages. And there they were, connected via digital technologies into my classroom, and we were doing this massive online open course, obviously. Uh, Catherine, Catherine is an instructional designer, by the way, very rare people to find. But instructional designers will, will tell you that when you're designing for a face-to-face, -face, it's different to distance or open learning. And here you had this mixed, flipped classroom, they call it, where people from all places all over are engaging. So your instructional design <coughs> changes, your curriculum changes, your learning outcomes change what you see as the end product. So um, we know the MOOCs video conferencing, video lecturing, the so, as I say, the so-called flipped classroom. MIT speaks about the future of education and strongly emphasizes the need for leveraging of partnerships between residential and online and between companies and institutions using digital technologies whereby maybe you're building BMWs in South Africa, but you need the expertise of the BMW guy in Germany. And you, it's, it's via video conferencing, and you follow step by step. Robotic surgery is happening more and more and more. So our curricula, our qualifications, our modes of teaching and learning have to change. We cannot only be classroom-based, um, face-to-face. Americans, Canadians, Australians, British, Irish, the Estonians, all of them are finding, if you want to massify, in inverted commas, I don't like the word, but I'll use it, higher education and make it more available and deliverable at a very reasonable cost to thousands of people who need it, then you have to go a different route to the face-to-face -face classroom. It's, that's too expensive. South Africa being a case in point. Our need is too big. Too many people want, and we're not giving it in the way we should. So MOOCs are there. Um, I'll, I'll skip that in the classroom. I just want to pick up. Um, there will be more interaction. There will be more, um, almost like study groups. And I'd like to bring it back to the Da Vinci Institute. And I'm not saying it because I, I studied there and because I'm involved there. I'm saying it because... The institute and the people in the... In, remember, an institute is just a building, brick and mortar. But the institute is also the people, and the people in it continually challenge each other and all of us to new ways of thinking, doing, engaging, emerging, and, and having this energy. And I think we, often people will say, what is different? It's just a private university after all. No, it's not. There's that, what Benny started the session with today. There's that thinking. There's that other, other stuff that happens. And so we as an institution of which you are part and of which you might want to be part or engage with, we have to start thinking in a different way to how we deliver. If we're going to grow our client base, the universities overseas, and there was a statement I was looking for, where... In fact, they're seeing this um, as, there it is, uh, Mitchell Stevens from Stanford wrote that elite universities have created alternative credentials. Now, we've just finished with an amendment bill, taking it through Parliament, it's lying on the President's desk to sign, which will once and for all deal with fraudulent and misrepresented qualifications, which are embedded within this whole concept of how credible are the credentials you carry, mm and where is it registered, and is your name there, and is it a true institution, etc., etc. 
These universities have designed a different form of credential carrying, where the blockchain technologies, where you as an individual start carrying quality assured micro pieces of qualifications that you have studied, you've worked different places, studied different places, all of this forms your your sort of blockchain credential framework. And what they have found, and what he says, all universities tend to grow towards new sources of revenue. And he terms this the recapitalization of the higher education sector. Because all of these elite universities are starting to offer these micro-credential courses. Micro-masters, you do components of your masters via digital technology for IR. And industry is flocking there. Because why? Because skills development, we're not only education and training, we're skills development. And if the research is to be believed, it's a huge third stream revenue, being able to deliver on time anywhere, uh, and, and not just in case type of education, but on time relevant stuff to people. That's happening. So Da Vinci may need to start looking at that. Initially, maybe not as a registered qualification, but as short courses, components of which can later on be recognized as uh, for prior learning, if we can get the regulator's head changed, and um, put into the bigger masters or PhD, because people carry these, uh, these modules. Global, regional, what are we doing? I just think of that Ernest and Young University of the Future, I'm nearly done. And they already in 2012, it's a huge topic, <clears throat> the, this, but I don't want to keep you. In 2012, they wrote, what are the, and it was based on the research of the Australian universities, and they identified five key issues. And one or two of these is they identified the massive increase in the availability of knowledge. Teaching isn't the same today as what it was when I used to teach. And my first school was in an Afrikaans, Wurzien School, Hygenote, in Springs, Noha. And I taught English, and I taught matric English, and my first year, our Shakespeare was Romeo and Juliet. Now you can imagine, in the first team rugby, most of them were in my class. And there was one I used to force him to be Juliet, and he used to say, Ach, nee, Jufra, as a blief. Jopie Burger, and his dad was the mayor. So that, that is my... <laughs> My introduction into teaching, <laughs> into teaching uh, um, English. Today I wouldn't be able to do it. They would know more than what I know. There's this massive increase in knowledge. There is this whole drive towards online, um, the mass expansion of access to university through digital technologies. In South Africa, where are we? We're in closing. We know that we have an internationalization draft policy. It is a very forward-looking policy. It's, in fact, it's a very good policy because it starts picking up on these issues of how do we engage two universities offering one degree via digital technologies, via distance mode, open learning, sharing of library facilities. Libraries are changing globally. There's also something that we need to remember. Large numbers of the world's population are displaced, or migrants, or refugees, and they've had to go without anything. What do we do for them? The digital credentialing that can help them when you carry your own little micro-credentials, your blockchain of learning, that can help you engage and come into a da Vinci because you can prove that you did something somewhere and you didn't have the papers. So, so um, we're looking at that. Our internationalization policy <coughs> speaks to that. There's a national policy framework developing. Our white paper for post-school education and training, the minister's policy, is very pro fourth industrial revolution. Sadly, it's a policy. And it needs brave people. Maybe it needs the Da Vinci's who will start, get a vision, move on and go. It needs those people to start implementing. The National Development Plan also says a whole lot about um, digitized learning, cross-cultural <coughs> learning, global citizenship. We recognize people are moving globally. They're learning everywhere. They're working in organizations all over the place. How do you carry all of that knowledge, gather it to make your world a better place. 
The mutual recognition of qualification agreements was one of my um, performance appraisal requirements <laughs> that I had to do for a performance appraisal and sign off. So we have, believe it or not, a whole lot of these things with China, with Russia, Palestine, Malaysia, um, Cuba, uh, all of these countries, France, uh, Brazil didn't want one. We have them, and these, the very basis of them would be fourth industrial revolution, sharing learning, digitized spaces, MOOCs, partnerships across continents via in fourth industrial revolution technologies. The Addis Convention across the continent, once that is, um, it has been ratified by our president, it builds on the Arusha Convention of 1981. South Africa wasn't a signatory to the Arusha Convention because we were an apartheid state. The Arusha Convention was revised to become the Addis Convention 2014-15. And what that says, and I don't think the regulator read it, they didn't realize, what it actually says is that anybody from the continent of Africa in a higher education space, if you've got a BA degree there, it's a BA degree here. If you've got a master's there, it's a master's here. So that starts seeing and envisioning this flow of people. Um, so the Addis Convention we've done, of the level descriptors are part of the NQF and Burin Chakrun, which uh, uh, one of the uh, people who, who works in the European Union and works very clearly with this, and he's talking about the development of a set of international global referencing uh, outcomes, um, which South Africa is very, very involved in, one of the leading countries, and that's part of this European Union-South African dialogue. So what comes through when we really do this thing, the fourth industrial revolution type things that we can do? We've changed our curricula, I'm saying futuristically, we're doing different things. There's mixed modes. Mode two is not strange. That's what people do, and probably even mode three and four. What does it give us? It gives us far greater ac academic freedom. We have to, however, ensure there's legal compliance. Every country has a, a legislative environment. But it also touches on the issue of ethics. And one of the big warning signals coming through uh, in the research, uh, I wrote it somewhere, it's in here, that there are so many positives, but we don't yet know what the potential negatives are. And we therefore need to have in, in our institutions where we teach and where people learn, and in our curricula, in our learning programs, and in the overarching learning outcomes of our qualifications, we need to build in those abilities for people to be able to see the good but also understand the impacts and deal with the issues and that is what problem solving it's it's a problem solving being very embedded and the ethical values mutuality complementarity comes through of qualifications across the world and the value creation of global citizenry so i think um i think i'm just about done quality assurance obviously is a challenge because currently um, unless you have really good trust relationships and unless you understand what you are quality assuring, what those agreements are, <coughs> what you, are you looking for, for somebody to display. And I'm going to close off with this. This, off, this evening, I think it's on the Money, money Show, Money Matters Show, whatever. I think you're between six and seven, I think. They're going to be interviewing and it's the it's some that, that uh, uh, something to do with a, a, a person who's got great creative abilities and solutionist thinker and they're starting the new series of solutionist thinker and the person they're going to be interviewing is the trainer the coach of the london the south african rowing team men and women's La uh, rowing team and the rowing team that won the 2012 <coughs> olympic gold a man called Roger Barrow. Now, we interviewed Roger Barrow. He's a member of one of the national sports federations, and one of our uh, PhD students is the head of coaching at SASCOC. And I'm part of an RPL panel. So they're interviewing this guy tonight. Now, uh, when you hear him tonight, 
Remember what I've told you. So he comes there to this interview of RPL because he's very interested in pursuing further studies at the master's level. So there's a group of us. And you know, teachers, academics, and people can sometimes do terrible things to other people. Now here's this man. He has coached to gold Olympic. He walks in and there's fear in his eyes because yes, it's this group of stodgy old academics who are going to <coughs> look at him and rate him. So now he starts, so yes, he presents. Now, the, the qualification is pitched at an NQF level 9. Go and read the level descriptor. You will see what that profile is. And he starts presenting. And we, we, so we chose the 10 different categories in the level descriptor, and he has to talk about those, his strategy. And when he had finished, I was certainly in tears. Des Warden was in tears. The other, one lady wasn't in tears. She was the difficult one. But we, I have never in my life seen such a presentation of strategy and knowledge and skill and team. Everything we learned and did in our modules at Da Vinci, everything we wrote about, everything we embrace and love. So now we say this is fabulous. So the question starts and he tells us his highest qualification. He's, the lady asks him, have you written a lot? Because, you know, when you're doing a master's, he says, I've only ever written five pages. Oh, well, then you certainly, what are you doing here? <laughs> He's just presented something that she, in her wildest dreams, would never present. His knowledge, understanding, said, he said, I'm totally dyslexic. I've used technology. And I use technology and technology-aided mechanisms to be able to do what I do. There was no doubt in my mind that this man, if he had come into the master's program, would have walked across that stage cum laude with his master's. Because why? Because you get computers you can talk to. Your wife can type or your husband can type or somebody. There are ways of, ways of doing. So when you listen to him tonight... Remember, this man was a man who sat in front of a panel of traditional and some Mo2 academics and laid his heart bare in the hope that he would be able to come and do a master's and be allowed in to do his master's at the Da Vinci Institute. And when you've listened to him and finished listening, think what a student that would have been and what an alumnus that would have been. He was accepted into Da Vinci, if I may say. But then workloads and other things put his studies off track and he didn't, he didn't pursue. So what I want to say is it's not only for the cleverest of the clever that the Fourth Industrial Revolution happens in education and training. Fourth Industrial Revolution technologies and those are also there for people who have learning difficulties, who have lost their homeland, who have lost everything in their lives. It's also there to move innovation and creation forward. Professor Anne Edwards, in closing, she's done a lot of work. She's a professor in Oxford, and she's done a lot of work with autistic children and the design and development and use of technologies in the fourth industrial revolution in environment to help autistic children. So when we as Da Vincians think of education and what we do as a MOTU institution and we merge and engage teaching, learning, education, training, skills development, all of these good things, and we look at our current income streams and our current student bodies, we could treble that. We could increase it. We could reach people that were previously I remember they used to talk about the uninsured and the unbanked. We could reach those two. So I encourage us as Da Vincians not to think as of, of the fourth industrial revolution as something strange, different and out there, but to realize we're living it, we're experiencing it, we're doing it, some of it. We have a theoretical underpinning in terms of our policies which are positive towards it. We just have to grab it and get going. So thank you very much.
Thank you, Shelley. Uh, any questions, comments, contributions? Do you think they're ready for what industrial revolution? And then, I think personally they're ready, but the main culprit in this is the regulation. Right? Do you think we should introduce mode two to the regulator? Because I think they still stuck in mode one. I, I think the regulator's thinking is slowly starting to change. Um, they're not where Da Vinci is maybe or where others are. I agree with you, some business schools are very traditional. But I think they are, in university contexts, it's probably in the business schools and in universities like Da Vinci, where you're finding the greatest innovation and creativity around it. I think what has to happen is that the regulator should be exposed more to uh, what it is, how it works. I think currently, um, when the regulator and the departments look at it, they see money, they, they think it's buying an iPad for every child, um, and that's fourth industrial revolution and we've hit the technology age, and it's not. So I think there's an education, information sharing, capacity building process that that needs to happen and maybe it's the da Vinci's of this world and other business schools and people like that who are who want to take people with them and uh, this is where Anne Edwards is so good relational agency issues um, why are why is the regulator like that so I would suggest that they are slowly thinking I think they feel a little isolated left out in the cold they realizing there's this the world's moving they have to move with it and maybe they just don't, nobody's come along and said, let me take your hand and come, let's invite you to our party. And if you don't like the party, you can leave at any time. I hope that answers your question. Um, at the beginning, Danny was talking about Leonardo da Vinci and his energy fields. And it appears clear to me that we are sitting in some kind of energy field because on the 15th of April, da Vinci put a proposal in front of NetBank exactly what you're talking about. Mm -hmm. I didn't know you would be talking about this, I didn't know you were studying it, but it includes a community of practice, dialogue training, recognition of prior learning, portfolio mm -hmm. evidence, mm -hmm. delivery of master classes in person through Zoom calls, mm -hmm. chatbots that take the learning and apply it to NetBank's mm -hmm. leadership development framework maps it against mm -hmm. their levels of work framework. Mm -hmm. So there's something going on in this particular institution which I don't think we're, we may be creating the energy, which is, a, I suppose, an artistic endeavor, but I think we're also drawing on the energy or whatever is being created. So I know Rupert Sheldrake calls those morphogenic fields. So there's something going on between us. And in order to come back, I think, to an art theme, I think Da Vinci's genius was he got the money first. Mm -hmm. And then he was able to have time to design weapons of mass destruction <laughs> and the Mona Lisa. We don't so want to design method. I think it requires us, yeah. and as yeah. we've been doing, and through Shan and, and mm -hmm. Kenneth and Mario and I and others, mm -hmm. I've been really saying. We're putting our stake in the ground, let's say, called real stake. <laughs> <laughs> a real stake in the ground, saying, if you're serious about this, I think what we're hoping is that a client like NetBank says they want it, and we're hoping they will. But we weren't even waiting for NetBank. Mm -hmm. We are going to offer this directly mm -hmm. to the TT100 alumni, mm -hmm. so we'd be meeting in order to do it. I think to make it an art piece, coming back to Vincent van Gogh, who never saw the painting in his life. Mm -hmm. He was posthumously wealthy, I'm not even sure if it's people because money. His thing was, I had to dream mm -hmm. my painting, and then I painted the dream. Mm -hmm. And I think that's really where I think a, a community like this mm -hmm. can continue in processes like this to dream a painting mm -hmm. and then to paint the dream. I think you 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 are you you picked up on that energy, and um, I, I I agree. And I'm just to throw in there that if you start reading the latest works by learning theorists, you'll start seeing there's those sorts of things coming through of that the energy, the dream, the making it happen. 
that robustness outside of the formal framework. Okay. Yeah. Uh, my question is that uh, as a labor intensive country, how are you going to overcome or to to welcome this for now? Just a revolution without having negative impacts on our labor resources. Are we ready? That is a huge debate. I I do not and maybe I'm idealistic. But I believe for every type of job we're doing now that we think could be lost, I believe that we have the potential, and it's institutions like Da Vinci and other <coughs> universities and other colleges that have to take this and grapple with this thing to provide the skills training to those people to develop the kinds of skills that will be required in professions that will Break, break away from their current profession, but they will be able to, to, be, to be different. And I know the labor debate. I've been very, very involved in that. And the we, mining sector, especially. <coughs> mining, mining sector, again, there's a lot of creativity happening there. There's a lot of change in the thinking, not <coughs> implemented yet. But uh, use of robotics, use of uh, uh, 3D uh, and nanotechnologies, nanomaterials, all of those things that can infiltrate the mining sector. Who's going to operate it? Who's going to do it? Who's going to design? Who better than the people who work there every day? I don't have all the solutions. But surely I always want to come in there. I'm not worried about that, but I do yeah. wish it happens. Yeah. Because why should we be employment agencies for people? It's something that was well, why, why did we create a culture that someone will give me a job. job. I mean, that's problematic. So we've got this paradox that we want to develop, but we want to say, well, I don't want to develop. You just give me a job. And dare you take that job away from me. Well, I want to say, I wish we take those jobs away. Because there will be many more jobs. But we, if we don't break the cycle, part of the almost uh, under, in the underbelly of, of, of this industrial movement, is that people must start taking accountability for their own futures. Stop looking at someone else to secure my future. We must stop it. I'm not your daddy. Stop it. You know, we spent 60, we, 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 we received 67 billion rand in skills levy over a five year period. And the research has just been conducted. I think I gave the report to, to, to Da Vinci Institute. When you look at the return on investment of the 67 billion, in the case of learnerships, only the return on investment is only 13%. And when you look at internships, it's 7%. So we have a lot of money. We have mechanisms. And I'm going to read what, what the research is saying over here and I referred to it earlier, the year of the micro-credential. Internationally, this is happening, where people, the programs are also helping in skills development as workers can quickly update their skills in fast-changing fields. It's that paradox between the regulator, the, <coughs> the, where, where we sit, and our current thinking, where we are possibly bogged down and tied to, as you say, Ben, and, and using a whole new concept of how we can engage in skills development using different mechanisms and releasing people from sometimes very inhumane working environments. So, um, but I don't have the re all the responses, uh, but I'm saying I believe we have quite a few answers that could already start assisting. Just a quick one for me. Um, Every time we refer to the fourth industrial revolution, we tend to forget what was the first one, what yes, was the second, second. what was the third, and what was, what is it that caused the movement from the first one all the way up to the fourth. Now, if we remember that we always look at this in context, that it is driven by market forces, it 
is driven by the change of circumstances. Mm -hmm. It is driven by irrelevance of even the jobs mm -hmm. that we see mm -hmm. are relevant and we will be taking forward. Mm -hmm. And it happened in the first as well. Mm -hmm. Remember when we were in, in the first, what were the mm -hmm. things that were happening mm -hmm. there? But from an education perspective, I worry because there's just way too many voices. It just doesn't seem to be one person who's looking at how those can be combined. Unless that happens, there's always going to be a challenge because education now can't drive this. But also, you don't want to be driven by something that's not regulated. So that yeah. is what I have a concern. I don't mind being driven by something that's not regulated because often you, uh, you, you, you will, it will be happening and then the regulation will happen to formalize, etc. So that to me isn't, but it's what I, what I spoke about uh, earlier on. And, what the, and I, I should have put it possibly more clearly, but there's a huge chunk of research that's talking exactly about that first, second, third, fourth, what drove. It was initially need, and then as this first industrial revolution and the dynamic happened and the social impact and the economic growth drove, in a way, the second industrial and that fueled the third. And we really are straddling, as I say, we have to, and our curricula and our education system, which I'm familiar with, we still need to take from this third industrial, the, the, the in, uh, internet of things and all of that, and carry it over into driving our fourth industrial. But it was always uh, uh, what the research was saying, and I found that what I found fascinating, is this social dynamic, mm -hmm. this impact, this people, the brave people who took this, ran with it, and made it happen. Yeah. All right. I would just say to that, from an energy flow point of view, I can bring it back to that. Mm. I think what the fourth industrial revolution potentially has the power of is we're working with globally people who became knowledge workers. So information mm -hmm. is now here. Mm -hmm. It's not there, mm -hmm. locked up in a cupboard or in the brain of a CEO or a priest. Mm -hmm. so it's here. Mm -hmm. And I'm almost not worried about all that counter-reaction of policy, mm -hmm. because in, the, in, in, in going forward, and we see it in the young people, they actually don't care about mm -hmm. the policy. Mm -hmm. They don't care about it. They will create their own futures. Mm -hmm. They will stick to our policies. I think you summed it up adequately there, Ben, because at the end of the day is that we spoke about jobs. We can't talk about jobs because jobs are very restrictive, you understand? So we must think broader in terms of careers, and careers change. And of course, if you don't change, obviously you're going to be stuck. Into, so you make yourself redundant. So I think the thinking, the thought process must be the most important or than anything else is that even the employers must think differently is that these people are people are employed and think about the careers and of course we've got staff development and those kinds of things. <coughs> but at the end of the day is that you need to take ownership. Mm. You need to you cannot sit there I believe you in an island and nothing's happening around you. We're talking about it and don't make it like I said, someone else's problems. Someone else can owe us this sort of thing. <coughs> we must take the ownership and, and embrace these changes and, 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 and co-create our futures. Mm. All right, thank you. Thank you for that. Please join us for a drink and there's a piece of Da Vinci for you. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs>